so many ways we thank you. This calling, this anointing, this power, preaching for us, witness for us, sacrifice. Keep in the heart of your hand, bless him, let him take us. Accept the young Lord of the world we've been saying. We thank you so much. Amen. Amen. I'll express my thanks to God for being with you today. Special Brother Al on this occasion. I wrote Bill, Reverend Bill Jones so many years ago when Al's mother came and said, Just take him under your arms. You got a chicken baby, but he's still here. The Lord stood taller for 50 years of Reverend Al shop. Degradation, attacks, stab in the chest. He didn't get the size he has now, he's been killed, but he went through so much fat that life could be just. <laughs> that life will get him in the backbone now. <laughs> We've stayed together at our home. Christmas time, there's the jails together. We gave him an award last Saturday, the regular push in Chicago. All the boys. There's someone saying, who will go for me? Someone said, Nehemiah yeah, sent me to be his. I'll go to jail for you. Fergus, Missouri. The other one will have to play it. That's the other Don't take Reverend Al Shopton for granted. Because he came that way out of them coming bunches like grapes. They're rare like pearls. It was to be a grape like God that he was in. Unusual way. The grape will lay out to him. He's thankful. He gave you the blessing. Somewhere on this day is my senior vice president, Randall Porch, Reverend Todd Gary, Reverend Gary, please say I'm Paul, he's our senior vice president. <laughs> my daughter, St. Titus, is something so grand, and I'll bring it in to my son, St. Titus. I babysit the other grand baby. Jesse Jr. is somewhere. I I want to resist what we mentioned about this is several temptations today. I'm tempted to just talk about the voting rights. It's so fundamental to our ability to survive. We've been asked to make groups without straw and make democracy without votes. You can't make groups without straw and you can't make democracy without votes. It's, it's, it's a big deal. It's not enough to talk about the voter registration. We need the Constitution to write the vote. And then we're going to have the states right to vote. So in the election, there are 50 states separate on it. We need say we need the Constitution to write the vote. States should not control our fundamental right to vote. We'll discuss that. Now, when it began to move out, we changed the course of the country in six of our. Just left Memphis last night. Guys, the day my heart is heavy, now I walk that down in my heart. Green pain. Six of our black ship, not both 35 years. Why were we going to serve on Germans? 18 years from the vocal serve in Vietnam. When I go on college campuses, we couldn't vote bilingually. When the black vote moved, everything else moved. We became the new majority. We're not the bottom. The bottoms we end up with the foundation. Yeah. 
every time you move, everything else moves to the foundation. A few of the torrential tornado. There's a nice pet house. The wind blew, drove off, you would be in trouble. The floor blew would, would be damaged. The foundation should everything we have to make adjustments. We are the foundation. Let's talk about corporate economic justice and the development of specialists in. Our corporation just devoured us by Jefferson and some of them every day. About some of my progress. You know, in Chicago two nights ago, after American woman ran for May and won, she was a black corporate lawyer again. She won 75% of the vote. She won all of 50 awards. Okay. State's attorney, an African-American woman. Lisa started picking her the other day. That found the other day, and I'll tell you the on the broadcast, maybe Monday. They found the white nationalists that come to Chicago and join them. Premises at the side there for picketing. It's a big deal. Don't stop there. Well, they tried to rape her. She didn't argue. She refused herself as Jefferson Sessions refused herself. The number two guy, a white male, made the prosecutorial judgment. That a nonviolent crime was not worth selling justice for the jail. He made that decision. And she didn't make that decision. Yet they make her the why is she such an object? The only we cool it down some was because the same male who ran the New York and the police chief ran New York to the morning shows, desecrated her. When the Paul McDonald was killed, the mayor held a tape back 400 days spanning an election. The killers say he came at them with a knife and they shot him, but the tape showed running down the street, shot 16 times. And me and the mayor gave the family $5 million as hush money.
brought here enslaved, sold and bought at the auction block. 157 years without a definition of slave office. When that first been declared, it's been 1772, it's been 157 years. A long time to work without wages and without the right to marry their own land. They got hung up on how to handle us. The Constitution took 12 years after the war. 12 years, and it's about that three-fifths of them. We kept fighting. The Supreme Court said, well, they have no right to white bound and respect. 1857, Red Sky. There's a verse of scripture that takes no meaning for me to replace it. Jack was our guy. The Yankee people said we had capital that land done with the Yankee still hit us. Around 56, we had Colfax and Drysdale. Who did beat the Yankees? Colfax was not going to pitch. The old nigga gave the worst. That was full of the NBA, full of the Final Four in March, Madison, all that. It's baseball. Colfax wouldn't pitch. Why? He read Exodus 13, 3 and said, Remember this day. God put his mighty hand in his bondage and saved God out of slavery. Is there anything in your life worth stopping your highest joy? Your religion. Follow me that. Only years of slavery, God lifted them out. Well, what happened to us was after 246 years. The South was winning the war. We got as far north as Antietam, Maryland, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. From the capital, the uh, capital for Montgomery and Richmond. Lincoln was going to lose. Lincoln made a big look. He said, if I could, could save the Union and send them back to Africa, I'd do that. If I could uh, maintain slavery and save me, I'd do that. But if I have to free them, I'll save the union. Because of the deal. Lincoln did this. We saved Lincoln. Blacks were the, the, the feeder line for the Confederates and the girls of cotton. We left our post and joined the union. We, did. we saved Lincoln and the union. He freed us, which was a deal. We saved him, he freed us. Now, during that season, if you will, some came up called Watch Night. It had nothing to do with the party brings and hammers. <laughs> we waited for 246 years for freedom. Lincoln said, on January 1st, I will sign the Emancipation Proclamation. How many people read the Emancipation Proclamation? Raise your hand, don't lie. You don't fall off. <laughs> Single most important letter to us is the Emancipation Proclamation. So, well, the 13th Amendment, the 13th Amendment opened open, open, open the gate for prison farms. Look at this up. We lived around as free people for the first time. Now, we got free several things out. The Satchel did the land free. We came from France to give to the abolition of slavery. That we marched around the country with the free Mandela, the free South Africa. We marched around France and Britain against slavery in America, abolished slavery. When slavery was abolished, they gave us a gift because that Satchel was not good as a welcome from Europeans come to Europe. It is that now it was a gift of America for any slavery. There's a day called Thanksgiving Day that always had festival occasions for the, for the group of the harvest. Lee saw that Ed Gisbert would descend to graves in his eyesight. He said, I want to thank God for ending the Union. Save the Union. He made Thanksgiving Day a national holiday by executive order. That kind of slavery too, y'all follow me now. I'm talking about a journey for 
Between the four or six years, we were free without equality. Free because we were dying. What were four days of you? Well, some some in the South got four days of you, but if you get four days of you, you can't buy seeds. Grow <laughs> cotton, you can't sell it. The terrorists kill you by night. Four days of nothing without security. You got that.
It's wonder, so wonderful to be here with so many people that are like-minded like me because, yes, I got my start in activism as well. My name is Lucy McBath. I'm the mother of Jordan Davis, the young man who was shot and killed in the National Loud Music case. But I now represent Georgia's 6th Congressional District, voting to see the new Gingrich once held. And I speak to you today as a member of the most diverse class in the history of the United States of the House of Representatives. In 2018, Americans elected a record number of women and people of color to Congress. And today, there are more women and people of color serving in Congress than ever before in our nation's history. And as a black woman, it is refreshing to see so many people who look like us represented in government. And I often think of the little black, brown girls and boys across the nation who see themselves in me and my colleagues. Though we have made great strides in terms of representation, there is still so much left to do to make sure that Congress truly does reflect the very people that it represents. And that starts with voting. Here's the truth. The more that Americans who turn out and vote, the more our government will look like the America that it represents. My Angela said it once. She said it best. Every voice is equally powerful. Don't underestimate your vote. Voting is the great equalizer. So I don't need to tell you that there are people out there who don't want everyone to vote. There are people out there who do not want each and every voice to be heard. There are people out there who are counting on some of us not turning out to the polls in 2020. Now in 2018, my state of Georgia saw particularly insidious efforts to undermine the right to vote for Stacy and for me. Polling places were closed in predominantly black communities, lengthening lines at the polling places that remained. Voters who failed to respond to a mailing were purged from the voter rolls, and an exact match voter ID law, which would have disproportionately affected black voters, was struck down by a court less than a week before election day. These voter suppression efforts are not a Georgia problem, they are an American problem. And we must shoulder responsibility for fighting this injustice at every single level. Just a few weeks ago, the House took action to ensure that our democracy works for everyone and to address voter suppression when we passed H.R. 1, For the People Act, legislation that included a bill that I introduced, the Election Officials Integrity Act. My bill will prevent chief state election officials from participating in federal campaigns and prohibit the use of official authorities to affect elections. table. 
Our house was filled with poster boards and preparations and hope. Hope that doors of opportunity, education, and success would be forced open to our people who have been oppressed for far too long. And yet, when it comes to voting rights, my father's work is still unfinished. My parents, they taught me to stand up for equality and diversity. And it's a value that I was proud to be passing on to my, so my son Jordan before his untimely death. See, I'm a mother of a young man who was killed because of systemic racism and implicit bias. My son Jordan was shot and killed in 2012 when a man opened fire on a car of four unarmed black teenagers. And that man pulled out his gun and shot ten bullets at Jordan and his friends because he thought their music was too loud. I understand it was deeper than that. So as a United States representative, I am blessed to be able to pursue the lessons that I was trying to instill within my own child. I was teaching Jordan to care for his fellow man. I was teaching him to stand up for those who did not have a voice. I wanted my son to understand the structural inequities that women and men of color face every single day in this country. And as a member of Congress, for me to be able to execute the very things that I was trying to teach him, to have the ability to be able to be part of a solution to break down the barriers for men and women of color at the federal level is truly God's blessing. And as people of color, our determination has been the driving force behind social movements that have changed our country for the better. Movements for social and legal rights for black and brown Americans were met with great resistance, sometimes in the form of hatred and violence. Nevertheless, we have persisted. And we must continue to fight fundamental inequities in all aspects of our society and making structural changes in our laws and criminal justice, justice system, those are just the beginning. In Congress, we are fighting for health care to protect Americans living with pre-existing conditions like myself, a two-time breast cancer survivor. <laughs> to lower costs and to make sure that every single person in our nation has access to quality, affordable health care. That is our God-given right. We are fighting for criminal justice reform. And we plan to build up on the progress that was made last year with the First Step Act. We are fighting for equal pay for equal work so that a woman doing the same job as her male colleague is earning the same salary. We are fighting to restore the Voting Rights Act. We are fighting to make it easier, not harder, for people to vote. The For the People Act is a historic democracy reform package to strengthen voting rights ensure transparency in government, and in the era of dark money in politics. We are fighting to require background checks for all gun sales in America, with H.R. 8 and H.R. 11 12, to end gun violence and ensure the safety of every American, and especially our black and brown children. We are fighting to restore faith in government and ensure that both our government and electoral system are working for the people, not special interests. And every day I wake up and come to work to fight for the people of Georgia, those who voted for me and those who did not. This Congress has accomplished a great deal in our first few months, and I am proud to be a part of the most diverse class of members ever elected to Congress. And I will continue to fight for common sense legislation to bring about meaningful changes to improve our nation and better the lives of people of Georgia's 6th Congressional District. It's only together that we have the power to bring about positive change and to improve our communities and our nation. And history has shown us that the black vote has great power to decide our elections. So it's imperative that we exercise our collective power to safeguard our communities and our futures. We have no other choice. Nearly every time that you show up to the polls, health care is on the ballot. Voting rights are on the ballot. A fair criminal justice system is on the ballot. Our environment is on the ballot. And a strong economy is on the ballot. The 
future of our nation is truly on the ballot. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, I just have to say this. Let me remind you that much is at stake, but we are prepared for such a time as this. Our American democracy sits on the precipice of moral and ethical decay, where the very structures of our government are under attack and dismantled before our very eyes, where we can no longer rely upon this administration's ability to govern with wisdom or sound reasoning in protecting our health care, our jobs, our wages, environment, reproductive rights, or our rights to live free from gun violence. We are prepared for such a time as this to combat the obstruction of justice and the rule of law which governs our co-equal branch of government. We are prepared for such a time as this to welcome those fleeing to our borders as a safe haven and respite from civil war religious and political persecution, and violence. We are prepared for such a time as this to protect and defend the poor, the disenfranchised, the undereducated, the homeless, the sick, and the poor. But to do so, we must mobilize our legions of people. We must mobilize to vote in 2020. So stand up. Fight back. Vote, vote, and vote in 2020.
Chisholm and Adam Clayton Powell, James Brown and William Augustus Jones, and of course Jesse Jackson, grew up under Giants, and now Al Sharpton is a Giant, and I'm proud to stand on this floor. Ensues. 
All of a sudden, Jim Crow descends on the country, the KKK rises up, the lynching epidemic, Plessy versus Ferguson declares segregation constitutional, and the black codes are imposed. This lasts for almost 100 years. Progress followed by backlash. But then a new generation of civil rights leaders, including Jesse Jackson, rise up to mark another era of progress, along with Rosa Parks and led by Dr. King, 1964 Civil Rights Act is passed, striking a blow against Jim Crow, 1965 Voting Rights Act to try to guarantee the right to vote, the war on poverty, the Great Society, Medicare, Medicaid, culminating in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. But then as often is the case, progress is met by backlash. And in that year, everything changes. In April, Dr. King is assassinated. And then two months after that, after winning the California primary, Senator Robert Kennedy assassinated. And with Senator Kennedy out of the way, in November of that year, Richard Nixon wins election. Running on a platform capitalizing on the anxiety at the progress that had been taking place. Sound familiar? Yeah. And that then ushered in a, a moment of anti-busting, anti affirmative action, anti-government. And when he declared in 71 a war on drugs, there were less than 350,000 people incarcerated in America. Today, 2.2 million. More people than any other country in the world. Progress followed by backlash. And then finally, a third moment, I'm going to get out of your way in a minute, a third moment of progress emerges with a new hope, backed by visionaries like Al Sharpton. When in 2008, Barack Obama is elected as the 44th president of the United States of America. That's my new favorite number, y'all, 44. So he, he's a great president, but then folks said there was going to be a post-racial America. But that lasted for two years, because then in 2010, the Tea Party runs and takes back the House, saying we want our country back, as if someone took it away, and in 2013, the Supreme Court strikes a blow against the Voting Rights Act to usher in a new era of voter suppression. And then ultimately, three years after that, 2016, the backlash is complete with the election of so-and-so. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Individual one.